important. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Anna to kick off the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Jannie, for hosting. Um, everyone, we are going to spend a little bit of time going over a case on headaches with the real DX uh, diagnosis. And so we'll go over that, but then we'll kind of dive a little bit deeper into headache management, just because it is one of the top diagnoses in, that you'll see, whether you're in clinic, in the emergency room, on inpatient. So um, I think it would be a good general overview for you guys to learn about. Then I think um, what I'll do is we're going to have a couple questions throughout just to make it a little bit interactive. So I'll send some poll it does not mean we're grading this at for any reason. It's just more for engagement and to teach you guys a few key points. And then um, at the very end, maybe I'll try and leave a lot more room so that you guys can ask not only questions about headaches, but also questions about going in the field of health and medicine. So um, I've been a doctor for 15 years and I've changed careers several times. So I'm now triple board certified. Um, and I'll show you guys. So even though I'm also a mentor to all of you with advanced e-clinical training, if you do sign up for the program, the pre-med mentorship program, that also you can get if you sign up for becoming a certified medical assistant. Um, and so that program is pretty incredible, kind of coaching you guys on how to get into med school and making your application pretty optimal. Um, so I love working with pre-med students. I also am an academic physician. I work at currently at AT Still University, Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine. I am a course director for the second year med students. And I teach them a lot on osteopathic manipulative medicine. And I also um, teach the residents and other students all kinds of different modalities. I'm typically doing more um, osteopathic and integrative pain management right now, but I'm originally board certified as a pediatrician. And then I went on to learn integrative medicine to help with chronic disease. And then I became a board certified medical acupuncturist because I was seeing a lot of pain. And then I built the first of its kind headache treatment center at Children's Mercy Hospital. It's a pediatric academic medical center in Kansas City, and then taught a lot of physicians um, acupuncture in regionally. And then I also founded a podcast, Health is Power, to help women with a lot of chronic health conditions, um, just because in the typical medical field, they're good at acute conditions, but not so good at chronic conditions. And that's kind of what led me to keep training. So I'm almost going to be quadruple board certified this October, because I went and did another residency in osteopathic neuromusculoskeletal medicine. So I've done a bunch of residencies. Um, I have a breadth of training, um, and I'll probably keep going back um, just because I always uh, want to learn something new. So enough with that. Feel free. I'm going to open up this chat box and Q&A. Let me see. So feel free to ask questions or chat throughout um, the discussion. Um, I can always pause if we're talking about a specific point in the headaches that I need to address a little bit more. So, um, and then don't forget at the very end, when we open up for questions that it's just a wide breadth. So it could be headaches. It could be just about the medical field, my, um, views or opinions, um, about going into medicine, you name it. Okay. So let's start with the real DX diagnosis. Okay. Hold on. Okay, so, all right, everyone, hopefully this is going to be loud enough. If it isn't, just type in the chat box and I can replay it. Great. Okay, so why are you here today? Because my right arm and my right leg keep going numb. Okay, and does it hurt when they go numb? Mm-hmm. Okay, and when they go numb, how long does it last? Last night, it lasted 40 
minutes, and net, today it's lasting like 15, 20 minutes. And how many times a day did it happen? It didn't happen at all yesterday except for the one time right, last but night. But today, now how many times? Four times. Four times today. So you think it's increasing in frequency? Okay. And so when this happens, are you able to walk normally, or is it, do you have an abnormal walk with it? I drag my foot when I walk. You when drag it's your foot because it's kind of numb. Okay. I'm going to have you do a couple of things with me. Um, first, I'm going to have you squeeze my fingers on both sides. Squeeze them as hard like we did before. Squeeze as hard as you can. Okay, now that is that almost hurts. That's good. So we'd say that's a five over five. Now do this hand over here. Squeeze as hard as you can. And maybe that's about a one or two over five strength wise, okay? And we're going to do the same thing with this arm over here. I'm going to pick it up. And then you're going to bring it down. I'm going to hold it up. And you bring it down against me. As hard as you can. Oh, okay. So that's a five out of five. And I'm going to come up here. And I want you to do the same. Bring it down as hard as you can. And that's about it. So that's... We're lucky maybe a one over five strength wise, okay? Then coming down here, we're gonna do this leg. And the same thing here. I want you to bring the leg back down against my hand as hard as you can. Okay, that's about it. That's about a one over five. I'm gonna come over here, you bring it down as hard as you can. Even see so you can even lift your butt right off the ground. Okay, so that's a five over five. Now we're gonna do your reflexes like we did before. And the same thing. I'm gonna put my hand right here. I'm gonna hit that, and so you saw, you saw the reflex. I'm going to come over here and let's put your arm like this actually. And so you got a nice little reflex there. I'm going to come over here. We're going to do the same thing here. And there's a little bit of a reflex. Okay, I'm going to come over here and there's a nice reflex there. And we're going to come down here and I'm going to do your knee. Get that and you got a little reflex there. We're going to do the same thing there. I'm going to take off your flip-flops. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rub the bottom of your foot like this. Okay, and this toes go down. That's normal. I'm going to do the same thing over here. And you know, the, your toes go up. Is it different? or Let's try that again. Now they both kind of go up. Okay. So, so that's okay. That's good. All right, good. All right. So... So we don't know what's going on, but you're definitely having some right-sided discomfort, a little right-sided weakness, and it seems to be coming more frequent. And have you been sick in the last week or two with anything, cough, cold, runny nose? But you're sick right now with a little cough and cold, runny nose, right? Okay, good. That's all we need. Thank you so much. One, two, three. Okay, so just reviewing a little bit of her vitals and a little bit more history. So she's young, um, she's 12 years old and normal vitals. So blood pressure is fine, temperature is fine, heart rate is okay, respiratory rate's fine, room uh, pulse ox at 98% is good. And what she didn't mention is that she is having some episodes of headaches as well. And so she reported numbness um, and that could also be happening, but she, the more worrisome symptom is definitely the weakness. And that's probably why I think this is the emergency room, why she's ended up in the emergency room. Um, her medical history, she was previously well, doesn't um, use any drugs, or cigarettes, um, and then I think she's been taking Tylenol or acetaminophen for her pain. So for you guys, I'm going to open up this poll. I can manage the poll, Dr. Anna. Oh, you're here. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. So what is your primary doorway assessment of the patient? This is one of the key things that you do as a doctor um, is what do you see right at the doorway? Is the patient non-toxic, toxic, acutely distressed, non-distressed, or um, non-toxic and non-distressed? I'm going to give folks a few more seconds to respond to the poll. Okay. Um, oh, 
did it share results? Okay, good. So, um, so a little bit of a variety. Nobody thought the patient was toxic. So, yep, that's good. Um, definitely more likely non-toxic. So toxic is usually when the um, child or the patient is very, very ill and you have to act right away. So means the patient's decompensating and is not going to make it. Like you might really have to intervene quickly before the patient goes into something like a respiratory failure or cardiac failure or a severe infection that's going to cause septic shock, for example. Um, acutely distressed, the patient is in pain. So definitely could say that the patient is in a acute distress, especially when someone has right-sided weakness, so also maybe psychologically distressed as well. Um, and then non-toxic and non-distressed seems to be the biggest one. Um, and so, yes, I would say in terms of the medical field, um, most people would say this child's non-toxic and non-distressed just because she's sitting there comfortably um, and she doesn't seem like she needs any emergent care right now. So those are great uh, responses. Um, and then let's go to the next question as well. Okay, so what is the biggest red flag in this child's history and exam? Do you think it's head pain? Do you think it's the numbness? Do you think it's the one-sided weakness? Or do you think it's difficulty feeling her right foot? Yeah, and it seems like a lot of people are answering that um, one-sided weakness. Um, the numbness, she does say numbness. And so it's very confusing sometimes as a doctor when you're really trying to get answers from the patient. Her numbness might actually mean weakness. So um, you kind of have to delve into a little bit more. And doing that physical exam was very important because that doctor did find there was actual um, a strength discrepancy between the right and the left um, when he was doing the exam. So she had right-sided weakness in her arm and in her leg, and she was also not able to lift her foot up very well. So the numbness sometimes is not as concerning in migraines but a subjective feeling of numbness could mean weakness. So very important to understand. And that's um, what's gonna lead us to our discussion here. Okay. Okay, so these are the red flags for um, headaches. So systemic illnesses or symptoms. And the doctor was trying to get to that by, did this child have any illness, um, a cold or any significant issues that could potentially be a red flag? And then if you look at the next one, neurologic symptoms and physical exam findings. And for this child, she had one-sided weakness, which is very worrisome for an issue called stroke. So, and that is an emergent issue that we need to intervene right away. So um, hopefully she was in the emergency room. And if this was the first time she had one-sided weakness, that does have to be looked at. A future episodes with headache and one-sided weakness, likely not so much just because we know it might be um, less, um, less of an issue, not stroke. Hopefully it was already worked up and she got a CT scan and was fine. Sudden abrupt split second or increasing frequency or a new change in a headache pattern is also worrisome. And then if the child is younger than six, because likely a brain tumor or older than 50, um, we have to be more concerned um, because they have more diseases at that age. So is it a brain tumor? Typically, this is what we have to look out for for any child who has a headache. Um, this is probably one of the big issues that parents are worried about. And less than 5% of kids will have a secondary headache, but we do have to be more worried about the kids who have a headache that's just sudden abrupt. No family history of a migraine or no family history of headaches whatsoever is very worrisome because there is a genetic or hereditary component to headaches and migraines. And then if there are signs and physical exam findings of um neurological issues like weakness or reflexes are abnormal, um, then we have to worry. The one key thing about kids is if they have a gait or abnormality, they'll be like walking very funny. They'll be 
not very balanced. They will ha might have starting to have seizures, which they typically didn't have. The other one that's not on here is early morning vomiting. They will have increased episodes of vomiting that's not really relieved by anything. And that means there's increased pressure in the brain. And that can happen with a space occupying lesion like a brain tumor. Um, and typically we'll order an MRI of the brain um, unless it's older person who is an acute, having an acute headache that has one-sided weakness, we'll do a CT scan to look for a stroke. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about headaches and why they're so important. So most people don't think that kids have pain, and that's why it's important to get this across, is that there are tons of kids, especially in the cities, that will have pain, especially headaches. Um, Headaches are actually the third leading cause of disability in the world, and it starts in childhood, and that's why inter early intervention is key. So it's as disabling as rheumatologic disease and cancer. So any autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, um, it is as disabling as that. Now, more of the headaches that you'll typically see um, if you're shadowing doctors, it will likely be more of these migraines, so with or without aura, tension type headaches, um, neck pain um, or neck issues that are causing headaches, and then a new daily persistent headache. Um, the migraines, they're usually very moderate to severe. So the pain is much worse than tension type headaches and it gets worse with movement. So if you're running or if you're jogging or you're walking up and down the stairs or getting any type of exercise, that typically worsens the headache if you have a migraine. And it's more pounding, especially if you get it um, early on. And then the criteria is unilateral, but often it is bilateral in kids. So you have to um, watch out for that. And then light sensitivity and noise sensitivity, nausea and or vomiting are pretty typical for migraines. The aura, usually only 10, maybe up to 20% of people have this, and it's usually visual. So that's one of the biggest um, symptom is that they'll get this little area in their visual field where it's blurry or there's kind of scintillating lights. It could be sometimes dots moving in and out of their vision. And the aura typically precedes the headache. Um, that's always usually the case, but there are a few cases where they'll have the aura with their headache, but that's more rare. Now, hemiplegic migraine, which you guys can start thinking about this because this is a migraine with aura, but that includes a one-sided weakness. And this is with the motor weakness. So you have muscle weakness and it is reversible. So usually when the migraine ends or when the migraine starts, the motor weakness or the muscle weakness will go away. Um, sometimes there's other sensory symptoms like numbness or tingling as well. And sometimes speech and language can be affected. Um, so thinking about um, what we see in our um, real DX uh, diagnosis. Now, vestibular migraines, people who are a little bit older will get this. And sometimes they don't have to have a headache and they just have dizziness where they just feel off balance and they feel woozy. And then sometimes they throw up because it's like a vertigo attack. But these vertigo attacks will last for several hours up to days. And sometimes they don't ever have to have a headache at all. So it can be very confusing. Um, but the most common um, diagnosis for a patient with vertigo that's lasting for several hours is actually a vestibular migraine. There's a confusional migraine too, um, which is interesting, and in that there is going to be a total confusion and amnesia and disorientation surrounding their headache, and it can last several days. I actually had a couple patients with this. Um, and then Brainstem aura is very, is a lot more rare. And this is where they'll get um, dysarthria. So they'll have speech impediment. They'll have um, kind of slurred speech. It's more um, trouble speaking and, and difficulty finding the words. They'll have the vertigo. They'll have ringing in their ears. They won't be able to hear very well. They'll feel like a lot of pressure in their ear and they'll have double vision. And sometimes they'll get balance issues, that gait abnormality where they're walking really funny. 
And then tension type headaches, that's just when you're kind of feeling squeezing or tenderness surrounding the head that actually causes that headache. And usually it's around the muscles. Um, and this can kind of coincide with a lot of the cervical um, pain symptoms that's called cervicalgia. And, and these are probably more common as the tension type headache and the cervicalgia. They often don't present to the emergency room. And then there's some migraine variants um, where the kids may actually vomit every few weeks and that's um, a common pattern and it's actually a migraine. Um, they could have an abdominal migraine where it just exists in their belly. The young kids can have this benign proxismal vertigo where they'll get frequent episodes of the vertigo, not necessarily with the headache. Torticollis will they'll have a spasm of their sternocleidomastoid muscle in their neck and then they'll um, not be able to move their neck in certain episodes, but then it resolves. And then Alice in Wonderland syndrome is a fun one where their vision, they'll see objects that are far away up close and objects that are close far away. And that's kind of what's Alice in Wonderland. Sometimes the pictures are all distorted from their vision. Okay, so um, there's multiple triggers um, and underlying pathophysiology. So we're looking at hereditary component, weather changes, stress, sleep, diet, nutrition, hydration, metabolic, hormones, um, all can um, cause a migraine. And there's multiple like physiologic reasons for a migraine, but the biggest one is that there is a storm going on in the brain. It's sometimes in a certain part of the brain, and it causes this depression of the electrical activity, and then it releases all of these noxious, inflammatory, painful substances that act on not just the brain, but on the tissue surrounding the brain, and also in the nerves in the neck and throughout the body. So let's do our um, third question for the poll. Okay, what diagnosis um, could it be after we kind of went over a couple ones? Oh, and that's supposed to be hemiplegic migraine. I think it got spelled wrong. So yeah, all of you guys are putting great answers here. So most of you guys are putting a uh, hemiplegic migraine and complex migraine with aura, which is great. So I'm actually gonna show you um, uh, what the, um, okay, doc says. All right, here we go. Okay, so you guys did a great job. Okay, if you look, here's the differential diagnosis. Hemiplegic migraine, stro stroke, um, a potential brain tumor or mass, um, moya moya disease, which is probably not. That's very, very rare. And then conversion disorder, which you guys wrote. It's functional neurologic disorder, which is also great. So your differential diagnosis was excellent. Um, so the patient workup is... Um, with her history, the 24-hour history of the five attacks of headaches and the right-sided weakness that lasted up to 45 minutes, um, the mom actually did report she had a history of severe migraine, so we got that family history, so that's um, pretty good in decreasing the red flags. She did get an MRI of the brain. That was good. That was normal. She did have an infectious workup and an inflammatory workup, and that was all normal. And the one key thing was that what you guys had written down was that one-sided weakness. Um, and she was also unstable when standing with her eyes closed. So her balance was off, um, but that can also sometimes happen, especially if you're weak, um, just because you don't have strength um, in that right leg. So um, let me see. Okay, I think we can bring up the next question, the next poll. Okay, so as we dive into... Um, her uh, treatment plan, what nutrient deficiency causes both sleep dysfunction and headache? And I'm gonna talk to you guys about this. So I'm just 
seeing what you guys think. Okay, yeah. So a lot of you are putting iron. Um, and then the second one looks like it got vitamin A. Um, so the the answer, which is kind of tough because a lot of nutrients can affect um, both sleep dysfunction and headaches. But the biggest one we'll go into is actually iron. Um, and that is a key one that is actually missed among multiple doctors who are treating both sleep disorders and headaches. So that is something that you guys now know that you know more about than most um, physicians. Okay, so let me, um, so the ultimate diagnosis for this girl, I know you guys talked about the complex migraine with aura versus the um, hemiplegic migraine. It, ultimately, it's likely that she had a hemiplegic migraine that is familial um, and it's a channelopathy. It's one of the more difficult um, migraines to diagnose just because the medications really have to be through um, different ion channel blockers instead of the regular ones. But I thought it's a good case because it's kind of an emergent case, especially if it's never happened before, just to rule out stroke brain tumor, et cetera. So it's a good one for thinking about your differential diagnosis. Okay, let's see what time we have. Okay, let me just run through um, just a couple things about headaches that you guys need to know. Um, the primary trigger for headache in the literature is stress. And then it's sleep. So stress, and when you get stress, it could be a few days before, and then you could have a headache or migraine trigger. For sleep, it can be the same thing. It could be not getting enough sleep. Even changing your sleep routine by one hour can induce a migraine, and then weather changes. Um, the two management techniques, I'm just going to go over the prevention because this is like going to be a two hour talk if I go over all of it. Um, prevention is really what we need to start if you're having four or more headaches a month or if they're getting very debilitating and they're long lasting. And so I think there's a lot of open access articles from what I've written. Um, so you guys can always like Google my name and talk about um, or put headache management in there. And then you can maybe even download some articles yourself. Um, but most preventive therapies, if I start a supplement or if I start a medication, unfortunately, it's going to take up to three months to finally become effective. And the problem with the medication studies is that most of them are negative. So we don't have a ton of great research right now in the pediatric population because we have such a very high placebo rate in the kids. If they're taking a placebo pill, it's almost as good as the medication, just because that's often how it works in pain or in a lot of chronic conditions. If you believe you are getting the medication, but it's just a placebo, it actually works and it treats your headache. So the power of belief is probably one of the best therapies for um, headaches and pain. There's a ton of preventive medications. I'm not going to go into a lot. I think she was placed on um, an amitriptyline, which is a tricyclic antidepressant. Um, now, more often, we do not place kids on medications. We place kids on supplements. So the reason for that is because the medications have such a high adverse event and adverse side effect profile that the kids hate. So amitriptyline causes super bad fatigue, a lot of weight gain, constipation. Um, sometimes it causes psychiatric hallucination and makes mood disorders a lot worse. And already kids who have severe headaches are already dealing with potential anxiety and depression. So we just have to be very careful about certain medications. Now there's anti-seizure medications, which is topiramate. Um, this can work pretty well, but again, we have to watch out for all these different side effects and we have to start low, go slow and titrate the medicine to therapeutic effect. Um, now we usually save these medications for like the third or fourth line until we get through a lot of the supplements and complementary therapies um, just because of their side effect profile. Um, beta blockers 
also work. It is known as a cardiovascular drug to help decrease heart rate and decrease hypertension, but has been found to actually reduce headaches. Meloxicam is um, like you know, naproxen or like Aleve, like ibuprofen, but it's a 24 hour. And this actually is a prescription. And um, hold on, I'm just going to look at the chat. Okay. Which medications would you want other than to avoid in the pediatric group? Okay. Yeah. I'll, and I'll get to that in just a sec. Um, so meloxicam, what's cool about meloxicam is that the unfortunate part of treating headaches, especially if you're not a headache doctor, don't have headache training, is that we give too much abortive medicines. They can only take up to eight to 10 doses of a tryptan, an ibuprofen, an NSAID, or acetaminophen, because if they take more than that in a month, so only eight to 10 doses total in a month, they actually have medication overuse headache and it worsens their headache. And this is typically what we see most cases when they come to us and they have a chronic headache, it's because they took too much Tylenol, ibuprofen, they took too much of the Excedrin, um, it's only eight to 10 times a month. Otherwise it worsens their headache. It causes a central sensitization in the um, brain and it causes worse pain. So meloxicam actually doesn't because it's a 24 hour NSAID and it also doesn't cause as much issues on the kidney um, or the cardiovascular because NSAIDs also cause a lot of death too. So got to worry about that. Okay, so these are the supplements and I'm just gonna talk a little bit about this before I get to more questions. Um, the medications that you'd want to avoid, um, in the pediatric group, um, is the, there's certain abortive medications called triptans that you can't give below six years of age because they're pretty powerful. And so, but anything above six years of age, you can give a triptan and um, all we might have like a second webinar to go over um, more like abortive management of the migraines. Um, but the other ones are really kind of taking into account all the side effects and the patient's medical history. So you kind of have to do a deep dive for the kids so that you don't give anything that could potentiate their medical symptoms. So it's, it's a really personalized care in um, headache treatment. So let's go into magnesium. Magnesium, most people are deficient in magnesium. We just do not get enough of this nutrient in our soil anymore. And so it's a mineral and minerals are much harder to absorb. And magnesium actually antagonizes inflammation in the brain and helps regulate pain transmission. And so we usually give magnesium in the glycinate or the gluconate form. Glycinate is at amazon.com. Um, it also has been found in the literature to decrease anxiety, help with constipation, um, and then help calm um, any kind of revved up um, anxiety symptoms, especially at night. Riboflavin is a vitamin B2. That's the one that makes your um, urine very bright yellow and orange. So if you're taking a B vitamin, that's the one that's doing it. Um, this is good for mitochondrial support. It's also involved in epigenetics and you just have to do very high doses. So you can't just take a B complex and get enough. It's for school age children, it's 200 milligrams a day, typically in the morning with breakfast. And then older kids like 12, like our patient, she needs 400 milligrams a day. Obviously for up to three months, before it even could be taking major effect. And then CoQ10, a lot of people hear about this because it gives you a little burst of energy. Um, it's also involved in the mitochondrial transport chain. Um, and then you wanna take 200 milligrams a day in the morning, cause it gives you a little burst of energy. And actually um, several people are deficient in this. Okay, uh, there is another poll question I have for you as I probably just shared the answer. Okay, there we go. Okay. What common sleep supplement may also work as an anti-inflammatory and decrease pain that has been researched in clinical trials and studies? And this is also a headache, um, now considered a headache supplement as well. Yeah, looks like everyone is about done. Um, 
So it looks like, yeah, everyone, oops, everyone is choosing melatonin. Um, oh, CDB, see, that's meant to be CBD. And then, so lemon balm and valerian root, there actually is some studies for um, calming and sleep. Um, valerian root probably has a little bit more than lemon balm in terms of research studies. CBD doesn't have a ton of clinical trials. It does have some research studies, um, but that is probably going to be something that we may be considering. It's used in pain. So CBD plus marijuana, they're using uh, CBD plus THC, they're using in certain chronic pain conditions. So good job. Okay. All right, so melatonin, the reason why it works is, um, um, oh wait, hold on, we've got a question. Would CBD be considered in the adult group? Um, you know, yes, the, honestly, usually at medical centers, the policy is we cannot tell you or tell the patients that they can have CBD as a potential treatment um, because there's just not enough research on it. However, parents are given it to their children. They're given it to themselves. We really just have to make sure it's a good supplement so that what it says it has on there and it doesn't have any THC because that can be detrimental to the kids. Um, but CBD, the hemp form that doesn't have any THC, um, doesn't it seems to work for some people and doesn't seem to work for others. So parents just, they have to be cautious when giving it to their children because certain supplement companies are just, they might not be that good. Um, so they have to do their research. Okay, so melatonin, um, this will be my last uh, topic today, I think. What time is it? 1040. And then um, I can start taking a lot more questions here. Um. Oh, actually, no, I do want to talk about iron. Um, that's a big thing that you guys need to learn about. So melatonin is an anti-inflammatory. It looks like indomethacin, which is like an NSAID. And so that's, it shares a similar structure to it. And so that's why they think it could be anti-inflammatory. It also works like one of those acute drugs they give in the ER called compazine and because it inhibits dopamine release. So if you have restless leg syndrome, People often will take melatonin. You should not take melatonin if you have any restless legs. So that means like you're like kicking at night, you're wanting to move your legs. You feel this like need to like move your legs. I feel like something crawling in your legs or you're having muscle cramps in your legs. You do not want to take this uh, supplement if you have that. Um, and then it antagonizes glutamate, which is an inflammatory substance in the brain and also suppresses CGRP release. I'm sure you guys have watched all those commercials on migraines and on the CGRP antagonist, like Ubrel V, for example, um, that melatonin actually suppresses that same substance. Um, Butterbur, we don't recommend Butterbur. It has some good data to it, but because we just don't know how the manufacturing companies, unless we really look into it a little bit more, have these alkaloids that they have to remove because it can cause the hepatotoxicity. So I, I have to keep researching the supplement companies to see which one is really, really good at removing those alkaloids. Um, and then let's talk about omega-3s, vitamin D, and iron, because um, this is very, very important since a lot of doctors also don't know about this now that you guys are going to learn about it. Um, and then we'll get into the questions. Okay. So iron and headaches. So low iron, actually low ferritin, which is the iron storage, which most doctors do not get. They only get a CBC, which is a complete blood cell count. You do have to look at the ferritin because the ferritin is going to drop before your hemoglobin or your hematocrit is going to drop. So you always should get a ferritin and an iron panel with the CBC. And your optimal level, actually, this just changed. It says 75 micrograms per liter. Now it's 80. So it keeps going up. And most people, if you get, if I'm doing a general lab draw um, on a healthy individual, their ferritin is typically. 30 or below. So we're having this big iron deficiency without anemia um, prevalence here that um, is unprecedented. You want to start slow because it can cause constipation and you want to give vitamin C with it. And so most kids, um, we give Celebrate. It's like celebration, but celebrate. And it's found on amazon.com and they really like that. There's a chewable form. I think there's um, 
there's capsule forms, but the kids really do well with the chewable forms and it comes in lower doses so that we can start low and then increase so that they don't get as many GI side effects or constipation because it can be pretty constipated and it's very, very difficult to absorb. So you typically can't take it with any other minerals like magnesium, for example. So if someone's on magnesium for their migraines, they really need to be taking their iron a few hours apart because they can compete for each other for absorption. So vitamin D, um, the research now is that um, vitamin D actually decreases migraines when given with another preventative um, therapy. Um, so typically doesn't work by itself, but definitely adds to the treatment. And so most people, so Dr. Richard Heaney, Robert Heaney, he did this research at the US Endocrine Society. We all become deficient if we're above the 30th parallel by February of every winter year if you're not supplemented with vitamin D. So I usually recommend everyone who lives above the equator, so especially in the United States, that they take at their adults 5,000 units a day with vitamin K2 because vitamin K2 helps add calcium to the bone and then decreases cardiovascular risk. It just adds a little benefit. Um, then they do that from October through March of every year. Um, so I don't necessarily have to test them just because of the research that's been done. And then kids, I'll do 2000 units a day. Um, so a vitamin D is one of those vitamins that does everything now, but really, really good research on vitamin D and migraines. Omega-3s, this is tougher for the kids to take because of that um, fishy burp that you get. And you have to take pretty high doses. It's three to four grams daily. And that's a lot of pills and they could be humongous pills. Um, Omega-3s, the best form of this is the Wiley's Finest Supplement. A lot of people get Nordic Naturals, but really the best one, the best company out there is... Um, uh, Nordic, oh no, sorry, is Wiley's Finest. Um, and I'll put that in there. It's Wiley's Finest and then Nordic Naturals. So I would not just get this at over the counter because there's a ton of chemicals in fish, mercury, PCBs. And so you want to, you don't want to get a concentrated form of that stuff in your omega-3 supplement. Okay. All right. And then my um, last thing that I just want to tell you guys about is acupuncture because a lot of people don't know about it. And what's funny about acupuncture is that in two Cochrane reviews, this is the biggest, um, biggest collaborative systematic review, the top evidence-based medicine in the whole United States. And that acupuncture was actually found to be more beneficial for preventing headaches, both tension type and episodic migraines versus standard of care or medications. So acupuncture performed way better. Um, and that's, I think, why we had a huge wait list um, for acupuncture. And that's why I continue to do acupuncture today because it works so phenomenally well for um, migraines, headaches. It also works good for low back pain and then knee osteoarthritis, um, very beneficial. Okay, so that's all I am going to talk about today, and then I can start answering all these questions um, that you guys have. Um, when, so when will you have access to the presentation? Um, I don't know if they give the handouts out. I'd have to ask Janie about that. Um, I... I just know they send you guys the certificate, but if you guys want the handout, I'm sure um, I'm okay with giving you a PDF handout of uh, this presentation. Um, and then do I ever prescribe feverfew or other herbs for headaches? Um, feverfew actually has great evidence. I typically didn't, but if the patients were on it, I just had them keep taking it. They're, the only thing about feverfew or some other herbs is just making sure that the child doesn't have any cross reactivity or allergy to it. Um, um, but yes, the herbs um, are great. They just don't have as much evidence compared to the nutritional supplements that I just gave you. Um, what are foods that build magnesium? Oh, well, that is a great question um, because I think I have a whole lecture on that. Um, let me actually see if I can pull it up real quick while you guys are asking more questions. Um, and you guys can even ask about um, kind of the, um, the medical path, the medicine path, or 
what it's like or um, what med school, how to prepare for it, um, anything and everything, or even about different specialties. Um, what would be the long-term implications of taking NSAIDs in the pediatric group? Oh, long-term implication. So of NSAIDs, that is a great question. It's very bad. Um, really bad pain, chronic pain. So not only in the headaches, but it actually can cause chronic pain elsewhere. You can get severe ulcers. And then the worst thing that actually um, data is coming out is that it can cause severe cardiovascular um risk and mortality. So it just, it, it does something to the, um, cardiovascular system and the heart and that it just, um, can cause mortality. And that's why there's these people, especially adults will just take ibuprofen and pop it before they go to bed at night because they have osteoarthritis and it's actually pretty bad, um, for you. And so we have to do a lot of education there. Um, Okay, let's see. Do, 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 do. Um, okay, are there any medications to defer those complications? Um, well, for um, the NSAIDs, yes. So for G iris, we typically will give um, PPIs, though PPIs, so those pro proton pump inhibitors, so it's the acid blockers. Um, we typically do that for a few weeks. We don't want to do that long term because that increases your risk of infection and worsens your digestive health. Um, so we have to be very careful about that. But um, but the cardiovascular risk, uh -uh. there isn't any medication that I know of that can counteract the NSAID effect. So that's why we have to do as much um, education on that as we can. Okay, um, oops, let me go back to, okay, I'm gonna share my other, okay, here's the magnesium question. Okay, so what are foods that have a lot of magnesium in it? So um, this is a separate um, presentation that I did, but so thinking about a lot of nuts and seeds, is where you're gonna get most of your minerals and magnesium is a mineral. So even like thinking zinc and copper, you wanna think about nuts and seeds. The other thing is chocolate, um, bananas, avocados, um, and then a lot of leafy greens. So, um, and herbs, a lot of leafy greens and a lot of herbs is where you're also gonna get your minerals from. Legumes, so chickpeas, um, and um, a lot of other nuts, uh, or sorry, a lot of other um, beans that you just wanna watch out for eating too much beans because you can overdo it. So, um, but that is a majority of the magnesium that most people eat. Okay, let's see. Could you please talk a bit about headaches and youth triggered by sports? Oh, yes, this is a big one. Um, so great question. This, so I was on the concussion team uh, with sports medicine and rehab um, back at my old uh, medical center, and a lot of kids in sports will get headaches um, just from overdoing it, and hydration is definitely key. The kids don't get enough to eat, and they don't get enough healthy fat, and that is probably the missing um, nutrient, macronutrient in kids who are doing sports. They just are not getting enough healthy fats. It's actually most people are not getting enough healthy fat because of the whole low fat campaign that was totally wrong. Um, that should not have been the case. Fat is that healthy fat's actually good for you. Um, bad fats like trans fats are really bad for you, but we need fat. Our whole body is made up of fat. That's the second ingredient in our body. The first is water. So we are definitely needing fat to help our cells communicate and to have that electricity as well. So um, hydration is really important. One thing that's missing also in people who play sports is that they're losing a lot more electrolytes um, just because 
through their sweat. So not only do they need to hydrate, but they need to hydrate not with the Gatorade, but with actual electrolytes. And so um, I know sugar helps a little bit of the electrolyte absorption, but if you can focus more on getting more salt in your diet, which a lot of people are like, don't put salt in your diet. Salt is necessary. Do you know how much, how many cells our body runs on sodium chloride? So the whole salt campaign is also debunked. Um, you do need salt. I mean, just don't overdo it so you don't get bloated and, you know, have a lot of um, water retention. But if you match the water and your electrolyte intake, it should be good to go. Um, okay, I hope I answered that question on sports. Don't forget about concussions, like playing football or soccer, hitting the um, ball with your head. I was a soccer player. I had so many concussions, but even just hitting the ball with your head is a mini concussion. And that actually causes headaches. Your biggest phenotype for a concussion is actually a migraine. So you're having migraines like every day as a post-concussion syndrome. Uh, what is your opinion about using Botox injections in pediatric group? We do, we use it. It's just, it has to be kind of the last line because um, they have to meet certain criteria and fail so many drugs in order to get um, your uh, insurance to cover Botox. Um, but it does seem to work pretty well for those kids who haven't gotten much else. I do a lot of um, procedures and nerve blocks for the kids. Um, as much as I can, I just put numbing medicine into around their head and certain nerve areas. And that seems to help them so much um, with their chronic daily headache, which they have. Most kids I see have chronic daily headaches um, for years, actually. So, um, so yeah, good questions. What else do you guys have? Uh, let me look at this other, hold on, Q&A. Okay, did I answer all of that? Done, done done. Okay, good. Okay. Well, I will see if they can provide a PDF handout. Um, I'll save that and send it on over to them. Um, but then meanwhile, if you guys um, are interested in that pre-med mentorship program, um, look through the, let me actually just show you this. Okay. Look through the advanced um, e-clinical website um, because they have different um, combos that you can do. So even though they have separate courses, um, you can actually get um, the sometimes the mentorship programs with a different course. Um, like a, if you get the certified medical assistant course, um, you can get the pre-med uh, mentorship program with that as an add-on um, for a little bit cheaper. And I think it's really, really good if you guys are interested in going to med school, um, just because it's so competitive. Um, and then becoming a medical assistant as a clinical experience, if you guys do that as needed or PRN or just as a part-time job before you go to medical school is, is really, really good um, in terms of experience prior to uh, med school. So I think that's it. Thanks so much. Oh, wait, hold on. Are there any screenings or genetic testing measures that can be completed for pediatric patients with a family history of a vascular component for headaches? Um, so the vascular component of headaches, now there usually is a vascular component of headaches, um, especially with migraine with aura, um, sometimes the vessels will dilate and that can be seen if you go have them do an brain imaging, like a brain MRI while they have a migraine with aura, um, especially if they have like a motor weakness, then it definitely shows more of a vascular component. Um, but we typically don't, um, do any different screening. The only thing we do differently for the hemiplegic migraine and the confusional migraine is that we do have to get an MRI brain um, if it's the first time, just to make sure it's not a stroke. Um, so that is the key thing, but we do lab testing. So we look at the iron, we look at, um, I don't get vitamin D anymore because I just start supplementing them in the winter. We do look at inflammatory markers. We look at thyroid. We look at celiac. We look at anything that could also be causing a headache that's actually just a, a systemic disease or illness. Um, and so that's what I'll typically do is get labs. Um, and then just if there's any red flags or if there's a hemiplegic migraine, then I'll get a brain MRI as well. So that's a great question too. 
Okay, I think that's it. Well, thanks for joining, guys. I'm glad you were here. I'm glad I got to help answer a lot of your questions. Um, I wish you the best of luck. Hopefully, I'll get to see you in the program. Um, but otherwise, I think that's it. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Anna. If there are no more questions, we can stop here for today. And thanks so much for joining the call. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Take care.